Hello, in this video clip we're going to take a quick look at money and banking. It's an important part of our economic system and for any of you who haven't been uh, asleep for the last several years will know that it's been a controversial part of our system. The role of banking and finance and um, the Federal Reserve, the creation of money are all very controversial issues uh, that uh, swirl around the Great Recession of the last several years. We're going to look at three things during this clip. One is a quick review of how economists define money and how we count it, M1 and M2. We'll also take a look at how modern banking works, deposits and loans and so on. And from that, we're going to see how the process of banks making loans actually creates money, multiplies money, and, um, uh, which is then available for consumption and use in the, in the economy. So let's first talk about M1 and M2. These are measures that policymakers use to define how much, try to estimate really, how much money is in circulation. M1 is the most restricted definition, and it typically represents cash plus what we call what they call demand deposits. We'll call them just checking accounts. That's good enough. And in the old days, we also used to throw in uh, uh, traveler's checks and so on. There aren't many of those left anymore. So let's just call M1 cash and checking accounts. So currency in circulation, but also money that we, you and I have in our checking account counts as money because with ATM debit cards and checks and so on, that's as good as having cash in our hands. So money in circulation includes both those two things. M2 is a little bit broader definition. And that's equal to, first of all, M1, all the stuff here, plus some quote unquote small savings accounts. So these are things, these savings accounts aren't quite as available or liquid as, as um, cash or something in your checking account, but it's pretty easy to get to them, transfer monies, whatever, and to use it. So M2 is just a little bit broader definition. Throughout our discussion, we're going to be talking about the increase and the decrease in the supply of money. And in other discussions, when we look at monetary policy, this is particularly important. When we do that, we're either thinking about M1 or M2, some sort of an estimate of the total money in circulation, including money in checking accounts. So that's an important thing to remember. Okay, let's go to making, banking. So I have, a, I have an account at a bank. Umqua, here in Oregon, for probably no more reason than that. I really like the name uh, of the bank, and so that's where I have my account. And so I have an account here at, at Umqua Bank. Now, let's say I'm digging out in the yard, and I come across a $100 bill buried in a can in the, uh, in the ground. And I take it to my bank, and I deposit it. All right, so now I have $100 that I'm going to deposit into Umqua. That's, um, that's going to go into my account. And two things happen as far as the bank's concerned. First of all, that $100 becomes an asset. They, they take that $100 and now they have it. So that's an asset and it's something that has value. But it's also a liability because they owe that money back to me if I, whenever I want it. I can write a check against that $100. I can use my debit card against it. Uh, I can use even electronic funds transfers. So from the bank's point of view, it's both an asset and a liability. Now, so what do they do with that $100? Well, if it's really dirty and torn up and so on, at some point they'll retire it. They'll register it, send it up to the, one of the local Federal Reserve District banks, in our case in San Francisco, and they'll destroy it and give the bank a fresh $100 bill back or at least credit on their account. Um, but what they really do is only save about 10% of it as a reserve requirement. Now reserve requirements are set by, more often than not, by the Federal Reserve. And what they mean is, is that banks have to, for every, let's say, $100 that a bank has on deposit, they need to have some of that in their, either in their vault or on account at the Federal Reserve District Bank. Um, to protect against, you know, depositors wanting to come and get that money back. 
Now it's not 100%. We don't require them to keep that my $100 in the bank all the time. In fact, we only require them to keep about 10%. So on average, big gross average, on average reserve requirements are about 10%. So for every $100 that gets deposited, 10 of those dollars need to stay with the bank. Some of that will actually be in real vault cash to stock up the ATMs or to provide cash for uh, tellers and so on. But most of that $10, let's say nine of that $10, actually gets deposited in the bank's own account, Umqua Bank's own account at the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank. So 10 bucks in reserve, what happens to the other $90? The other $90 gets loaned out, at least in traditional good commercial conservative banking circles. That extra $90 of that 100 that I first, uh, that I first deposited, that $90 gets loaned out. And that's how typically how banks have made their money. So they'll loan out the $90, they'll charge interest on it, and um, on the assumption that I'm not going to go in right away and, and get that $90 out. Or if I do, somebody else will already deposited some money. So the $90 gets loaned out. Let's say, now these are all small numbers. If we added a, zero, a couple zeros to it, we'd be talking some real money. But let's say somebody borrows that money in order to buy a car or to um, start a home remodeling project or something like that. That $90 is going to go into somebody else's bank account, maybe a Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo Bank. So maybe somebody borrows that money and gives it to a car dealer or gives it to a contractor or somebody like that and, or, and says, okay, here's your money, I just borrowed it from the bank, go ahead and give me your car or um, start the remodeling project. So that $90 actually goes into somebody else's account in a different or similar bank, doesn't matter which. And now that's a deposit just like my $100 was a deposit up at Unqua. So the money that got loaned out by Unqua is now sitting in somebody else's checking account. And Wells Fargo will keep 10% of it, which in this case is $9. Up above, the 10% was 10 bucks. But now Wells Fargo is going to keep nine bucks of it, some of it in vault cash, some of it on deposit at the Federal Reserve, and they can loan out $81. They can loan out $81 to somebody else. Well, that sounds fine. You know, that's kind of the way banks work. They take our money, they hold on to it, they give us ATM and debit cards, uh, they try to charge us fees for that, but the popular uprising uh, prevented that. And, uh, but primarily what banks do traditionally is they loan out some of the money that's deposited. They earn interest on it, that's how they get their income. And that money actually works its way through the economy several times. Now let's go back and look at the definition of M1 as an example. This is the supply of money. Now, I originally had $100. It's kind of like fun, fun found, not fun, found money. So new money that's been discovered is being in a can underground for a long time. And, and so uh, when it goes into Umpqua, we have that $100 bill, and it's, it's actually now in the bank, and now my own credit, and my own um, uh, checking account has $100 in it. Remember, M1, our measure, one measure of supply of money, includes not only currency, but money that's actually on our account, in our ch uh, checking account. So now, uh, so now we have that hundred dollars, and then. But let's follow here. Remember how we had ninety dollars loaned out into Wells Fargo. So now somebody has ninety dollars in their checking account, and I still have a hundred dollars in my checking account. So just in that one transaction, the supply of money has gone from a hundred dollars up to one hundred and ninety dollars. And if that $81 gets loaned out to somebody else, that gets added onto it as well. What we're talking about here is this title I've written up on the board called Fractional Reserve Banking, 
where, and this is a traditional thing that's been going on for more than 100 years, where banks are only required to keep a certain amount of their money that has been deposited, and they're, they're allowed to loan the rest of it out to, to uh, customers and businesses and so on. This process of fractional reserve banking means that when you add or inject some new money into the system, it kind of cascades through and at each step of the way ends up being some more money ends up being in somebody's uh, checking account and the supply of money increases. So without printing going, without running a bureau printing and engraving or doing anything else, bank, these banks have created money just in their normal course of business. Now there's actually a money multiplier in theory that's driven by those reserve requirements, the one I just erased. So the money multiplier is a way to estimate how much money gets generated from that initial deposit. The formula is 1 over the reserve requirement. Now, just a minute ago, we said that the reserve requirement, on average, is about 10%. If we write that as 0.10, we write that reserve requirement as 0.10, then the money multiplier is 10. In theory, injecting $100 into the system, this found money that I got in the backyard, injecting $100 into the system, and then in letting it flow through bank after bank, loan after loan, if everybody does things as we predicted here, that'll end up increasing the money supply by a thousand, by a factor of ten. Hundred dollars in and originally multiplied by ten. Now it's not really that high. For a variety of reasons. Sometimes banks, even though they can loan out 90 percent of a deposit, sometimes they'll hold on to their excess uh, uh, deposits, some of them, and maybe they'll only lend out 50 or $60, and they'll keep the rest. It's actually something that's been going on as part of our slow recovery from the recession, is that banks aren't loaning this out very quickly for a variety of reasons. And, um, and sometimes people may borrow that money, but some of that money might get siphoned off for consumption and not be absolutely directly uh, deposited back in some other account. So what's the true number? I don't know. Uh, probably, I'm going to guess roughly 5 or 6 instead of 10 as a multiplier. But the important thing to remember, especially for my principals of macroeconomic students, the important thing to remember is that there is quite a bit of leverage in the system. If we add some new money in from where, whatever source, from the Federal Reserve, from finding money here, if we add money in, the total supply of money, the money stock, is going to increase by some factor, by some multiple. It's also true in the other direction. If you remove something, and uh, like a bank fails and some of those accounts go away, as happened in the Great Depression, then not only does that money itself go away, but there's kind of a reverse multiplier effect as, as well. Now, one thing that can happen, and issues that we're going to be looking at in other parts of the course, are one, what happens if the Federal Reserve changes the reserve requirements? Remember, this multiplier is based on a, on a sort of average reserve requirement of 10%, 0.10. What happens if the Fed increased it, doubled it to 2, uh, 0.20%? 20%? That would mean then that the multiplier would be cut in half. So changing the reserve requirement is a pretty big sledgehammer, and in fact, the, the uh, the government policy, the Federal Reserve typically, uh, has been reluctant to change reserve requirements as a way to change the supply of money. They might do it for other reasons, but not for that. We'll look at some other issues, too, in, uh, associated with that, including monetary policy, how the Federal Reserve uh, makes it easier, easier or harder for banks to hold on to that 10% that they have um, that they have to have in reserves, and, um, and we'll talk more about that in terms of monetary policy. And the other thing that's been very important in, uh, in recent years is that banks have moved, many banks have moved away from this sort of traditional accept deposits and then make loans sort of thing. Instead of making loans, which presumably generates economic activity, 
Instead, they've been speculating in other assets, including securitized mortgages and so on. Lots more to say about that, but uh, we'll cover that at a different time. 